Hey there! We just wanted to take a moment to thank each and every one of you who have listened, shared, engaged, and sent us love. It means the world to know that we've had the chance to spread even just a little bit of knowledge, insight, and encouragement to you along your health journeys. If you'd like to support the work we're doing, we've created a Patreon page where you can earn some exciting rewards, because being a part of the HIP team isn't just a hobby, it's a lifestyle. Contributions start as low as $1 a month, with each level offering a number of super fun perks, like monthly bonus episodes, Q&As, a portrait drawn by our own in-house artist, and even personal chats with the Health It's Personal team. We created this podcast so that everyone can have the chance to access informative, inspirational, and insightful stories. And your support is a huge step in us reaching those who need it most. We wish we could give you all a big hug, but hopefully this will suffice, at least until we're allowed to hug again. If you love what you hear or are as passionate about health as we are, please visit patreon.com slash the hip podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash the HIP podcast. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you again. And thanks in advance for joining our ever growing hip family. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Health It's Personal. We're having an amazing time talking with nutritionists and friends about their tips, tricks, and healthy food journeys. And this week is unique because we're sharing clips from interviews in our anxiety series. Never before heard of some of our favorite anxiety series guests and their perspectives on nutrition. And it's really helped us reflect on our own food journeys. We are all kind of anxious about the foods we eat or if we're doing it right. But at the same time, we've learned so much about how what we eat impacts our mental health as well. So it's really cool to see that interaction, you know, between our gut and our minds and just how we navigate life. I guess we can share a little bit about what we've been through when it comes to that. I'd love to hear more about that if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, so Max has been diagnosed with ADHD, and both McKenna and I experience anxiety. Through the support of our naturopath doctor, we spent a lot of time thinking about how the foods we eat make us feel. And so McKenna and I both journal the foods that we eat. We've um, eliminated some foods, but as a mom, I've really spent a lot of time thinking about how to fuel Max's brain so that he can be the best version of himself. Yeah, that's really great. And I know that you've told us a little bit about what you do to help him with that. I know you like if he's playing video games, you'll just put like some protein nuts to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try to get good food into his body. It's hard to do with a teenage boy. It's really important that I make sure that he has protein and fruits and vegetables in his diet. And yeah. when I can see that he's kind of hitting a wall or he's getting a bit moody, mm-hmm. I immediately am like, what can I make you for lunch? Or what can I make <laughs> you for dinner? <laughs> um, because I know that that makes an impact on how he feels. He doesn't see it yet. Yeah. He doesn't make the connection. Well, I was going to say, like, we've all heard, like, it's been in pop culture for a long time now and memes and everything. But like, when we get hangry, that's yep. a part of it. <laughs> and But it's funny because we all notice when we're, but we don't really know that for ourselves. Usually we notice it in other people. Other people, And yeah. sometimes we can tell like, oh my gosh, I'm, but like, we can't help it in the moment. Like, even if we do realize it, we're like, I <laughs> <laughs> so hungry but I'm so mad (laughs) I can always tell when McKenna hits a food wall when she's ready to eat it's like ready go well and we've talked about this before and I don't think it's hangry (laughs) I don't get mean or treat people poorly but I'll go a long time without feeling hungry and thinking I don't need to eat or start to cook and then it hits me all at once and it's like I have to eat Mm -hmm. now (laughs) And everyone else will be deciding on a restaurant and I'll start mm-hmm. saying things like, are we going? Or <laughs> <laughs> or it's like, let's chop those veggies. Go, go, go. But my brother and I differ in that I've always been adventurous with food and leaned more toward fruits and vegetables and cooking for myself, even as a teenager. But I also have always had stomach pain, acid reflux, poor digestion, also anxiety and depression at times. Yeah. And once I started a relationship with my naturopath, I completely changed my relationship with food. And that was ultimately a catalyst for my overall well-being improving. Yeah. And like as we've been learning, all works together. So we have to have that foundation. Like we are what we eat and all of those cliches. (laughs) But it's true. And I was going to say, my, my it runs in my family, all of those things that you described with digestion and acid reflux or 
you know, whatever else uh, happens in our guts and our digestive systems and, uh, and anxiety and depression. And it's, it's also closely related and it all depends on the in- individual. Like we've been learning about from everyone, like it's all, it's very personal, right? It's personal, yes, it is. <laughs> but for all of us, that is at least a part of the equation. So we just have to, like you said, learn yourself. It's a great point. What do you notice, Sean? How does food impact kind of your family life? So, yeah, we, (laughs) uh, it's kind of the situation like McKenna described with the, like, especially for me, like I'll go forever. Like sometimes I can forget to eat. That's fine. I can go like all day and it's 4 PM and like, Oh, now I really need to. (laughs) So sometimes you have to be on top of yourself, even if you're not hungry and just make yourself eat. And that's a challenge sometimes, especially first thing in the morning when it's probably the most important time to eat. Um, so sometimes like, and it's good to have support. That's one of the biggest things that you can get is support because you're not going to be likely to do that for yourself. Even if you are so aware of everything, (laughs) like I know what I need to do. (laughs) <laughs> no, I love that point so much because McKenna and I, are, we support one another in yeah. that. And I know that it's been like this in the past um, in my house. But if one person is not eating healthy, it's hard for someone to stay on the right path, right? Yeah. Or you can impact the other person in a positive way. Yeah. And that's what we try to focus on because I think it's it's easier for me, at least, um, maybe for my personality to try to look out for someone else, but I don't really have interest in doing that for myself. And that's something yeah. that I should continue to work on. And I am doing a lot better with that. But, you know, it's it's much more desirable for me to be like, I want you to be the best person you can be. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe right? so I don't focus on myself. So Sean, what do you do in your house to kind of keep yourself in check since it's not a habit for you to check on yourself? What I I try to do is, especially if you have ADHD or things like that. If things are out of sight, it's the out of sight, out of mind cliche as well. Um, That's very true for certain, um, you know, maybe neurodivergent people. And if you don't see that there, then you don't remember, like you're not trying to forget it. It's just, it's not right here. So I'm not, it's not a priority. And so if you try to arrange things in a way that makes sense, or like when you open the fridge, you see those things, you're like, I have to eat those vegetables before they go bad because then if I forget about it and they go bad and then you feel really guilty about that or you're angry that you wasted the money or the time or that I was looking forward to that or like another thing I do is I save certain things especially perishable items like I want to save that for the perfect moment and sometimes you just have to go for it and and it's funny because like when you play video games sometimes you do the same thing with your things in the video games like I have to save this for the perfect moment but you just have to use it like (laughs) it's there to be consumed that's so funny um, so you just have to be on your on top of yourself. Like I need to eat that. <laughs> How about you, McKenna? What do you do in your household? Especially, you know, I know being with your family, you have that support group. I know you and your mom especially work well together when it comes to these topics. But when you're, you know, back in New York and you're on your own again, how do you manage that? Yeah, I definitely have people to inspire me here, but. When I go home, I have to hold myself accountable, and my favorite way to do that is to not make healthy eating feel like a chore. Mm -hmm. It's about those positive feedback loops, you know? So I give myself a reward and keep a balance, so I find new recipes to cook. I've been cooking out of the Blue Zones cookbook, and then, you know, living alone and balancing a crazy New York lifestyle, I tell myself, okay, I'll cook two servings worth of food three nights a week. So I have three fun recipes to try. I don't have to cook every other night in case I work late or just don't feel like it. And then one night a week, I give myself the chance to eat out with a friend or order something in. And eventually you get to a point where you're eating all of these delicious, healthy foods each day. And you don't even crave sugar or fried foods anymore. And so when I have my fun meal out, I want the fish instead of the fried chicken. Or I'll keep a cauliflower crust pizza in the freezer and feel absolutely content. You know, something that you do, McKenna, that I love is that you you go to the market and buy nice food for yourself. So you splurge a little bit, but you're just one person. So your bill doesn't get too Mm -hmm. high, but you get really nice like pasta with a filling or yeah that's the hugest thing I make my grocery shopping a priority I make it fun and I make it diverse and good quality so I actually go to three different markets to get different things I love that I go to a Middle Eastern market to get international ingredients 
Then I go to a family-owned fruit market and then to a higher-end market where they have handmade pastas and really good cuts of meat and fish. I am just one person, so it doesn't end up being too expensive, and I save money on spices and fruit by going to the other two markets and then splurge on the things that I want to be quality Mm -hmm. and that are locally sourced, which always adds to the price. But when you save in other areas, you can have those few fun things that make cooking feel much more special and feel better for your body. I was going to say, like, we hate hate grocery shopping, but um, it's... That's something we should explore in the future is how do we make that fun? Because I think that's a big hurdle for maybe maybe other people. <laughs> yeah, and I look forward to doing it. I fit it into one of my relaxed weekend days. Not everyone has that luxury, of course, or even wants to do it. <laughs> but I know what it feels like when I don't eat healthy and locally and I feel awful. So mm-hmm. it's worth it mm-hmm. for me to take the extra time and place in my budget. Nice. Mom, how do you stay true to your healthy eating habits when you have a bigger family and two boys in the house? Right. Well, it's definitely easier when McKenna's here. And what you were saying earlier, Sean, about holding someone else accountable, when McKenna and I hold each other accountable, it's not in a like, oh, you missed a spot type of way. Yeah. (laughs) But it's like, share what you ate tonight so I can get inspired to make a recipe. But also, if I worry that she's not drinking water, you know, or if I remind her to drink water, it reminds me. So it's it's really helpful. Yeah. Two things that I do that's helpful to me. Um, One is I really try to keep my water intake where it should be. Mm -hmm. I try really hard to drink enough water each day because as McKenna mentioned, we both have gut issues. Our stomach hurts a lot. When I drink a lot of water, I feel so much better. So I don't do perfect with it but I am mindful of it and I've got, I've made it a habit. And so even when I don't drink enough water, I notice that I didn't do a good job and I try to start fresh the next day. The other thing that I do is um, McKenna is definitely the chef. Um, I am not. And so I like simplicity. And so we can kind of get in a rut meal wise, but sometimes in a good way. So for example, we've been eating bowls (laughs) Hmm. where Mm -hmm. we have a base like quinoa or couscous or a lot of times rice and then tofu and veggies. So you can mix it up and make it Mexican or you can mix it up and make it coconut veggies. And then I can cook meat separately for the boys because I'm a vegetarian. So um, something like that is really easy to make delicious for everyone in our family so we can do something like that and you can mix and match like you said yeah absolutely and then after a while you get kind of tired of it and you Mm -hmm. move on to something else but sort of having a different bowl each night for four days in a row it doesn't get too mundane for us because we switch it up but it makes it simple in the mind because all you have to do is stir fry some veggies and cook the rice and sometimes you have leftovers and it works out good Yeah, I was going to say, like, I like meals like that because it's funny because my, you know, a lot of people's issues are probably around, I don't want to cook because that's a lot of energy and effort. But for me, it's actually, it's going to be really funny, but (laughs) to say, but it it takes me a long time to eat. I'm very like meticulous and diligent and, you know, the slower you eat, that's what they tell you a lot of times if you're trying to eat a little less, just eat slower and drink more water because it fills up your, you know, your stomach takes a little while to send that signal that it's full. Um, But maybe that's part of my issue. (laughs) Um, I I just go slow and you enjoy the moment maybe if it's something that, but sometimes it feels like a a chore to eat and it sounds really funny to say out loud, but it really does. That is funny, (laughs) but I can see that. So with Sean's aversion to shopping, my (laughs) inability to cook And your busy lifestyle, it makes it really challenging for us to eat healthy. But we've learned along the way that it's important for our minds and our bodies. What are some recipes? Is there anything quick? I shared my bowl, my bowl recipe. So, well, I don't know if this is the best idea. We're we're, the verdict's still out on this, but um, but we've been eating crispy tofu. It's so good. So you cut firm tofu in little squares and then you toss it in cornstarch and put it, brown it in a little bit of olive oil. And then you can add it to your rice or quinoa bowl. So, um, the other night, this was so fun. We took cauliflower and roasted it in the oven. And then we tossed the crispy tofu and buffalo sauce. 
And so we had veggies like onions and Mm -hmm. zucchini or whatever you want. And then also the cauliflower and then the really great buffalo sauce and quinoa. It was so delicious. But you can have it with, of course, any combination. So if you want Mexican, you can do roasted corn and black beans, avocado, tomatoes or salsa, and then put the tofu on it. I love it. And so easy to eat, too. (laughs) Yeah. What's something fast and easy you do, McKenna? So, like I said, I love the grocery. (laughs) I try to make it fun, but usually I'm eating something super simple because I feel like when you're cooking with simple, fresh ingredients, you can understand the dish you're making, have a bit more control, and feel like a better, more confident cook. Yeah. So, my market makes ravioli in-house, so I'll buy that, for example, in gluten-free with butternut squash, Mm -hmm. and I just boil a few of those, and on my plate, I'll put a bunch of arugula around it and drizzle it with olive oil and vinegar, maybe throw some figs on there, and then in a pan, fry up some cremini mushrooms or some fun mushrooms (laughs) and veggies, and even though I'm just having four or five ravioli with a ton of salad and veggies, it feels a little indulgent. Yeah. And it's so cheap when you're cooking for one person. I think the pack of ravioli is $5, which seems like a lot when you can buy a box of spaghetti for $1, but it'll feed me for four nights and it feels special and it takes about five minutes. That's like something you'd spend $35 for. (laughs) So, um, and I'm going to go a different route since we've had some great recipes here. Uh, I'm going to kind of share with people who might need like depression meals. Because that's a thing, right? If you're in the moment, you know you need to eat. Maybe you're the type of person who doesn't eat for comfort in those moments. You're the one who like can't, right? And so you know you need to eat something, and you just don't know what to stomach. You have no appetite. You know that anxiety or the depression is really, in, you know, impacting you in that moment. Um, so I think this can be really useful. Um, you know, if you have those moments like me, uh, what I will do is I will try to do something that's a comfort food but also healthy. And, you know, you know, stretching that term a little bit, but um, peanut butter is a really great, you know, um, oatmeal is a really great thing. So anything with oats, I try to do that's really easy and simple because it's easy to digest. It's gentle on your stomach. Um, Peanut butter is, you know, very tasty. It's one of my favorite things in the universe. And it's you still get protein. So at least it's not terrible. Um, So I will try to do the cell, you know ants on a log no <laughs> um celery with peanut butter or something like that or even carrots with peanut butter um something that's healthy but it has the peanut butter on there so it like is a nice balance or um one of my favorite things to do when it, it's a really dark moment is if you have like a good cereal i know we try to avoid cereals but um if you have like a i really like fibrous cereals you know if you have you know you have those those healthy ones that you can buy at, at trader joe's or sprouts or whatever you know, it has lots of fiber in it, so it's not terrible for you. Um, sometimes they have protein in them as well. And if you get like that that uh, dairy alternative milk with protein in it, the unsweetened, because I can't do the sweetened milk, that's weird, <laughs> as we've talked about before. Um, but you yeah. just get like a fiber bowl of cereal and you put the protein milk in there. So little yeah. things like that. Or hummus too. Hummus goes with so many things. If you get like chips or crackers, even though that might be unhealthy by themselves, if you get the hummus on there, you're at least having that moment <laughs> where it's comfort food but not terrible yeah even with fruit so make sure that if you're having something sugary that you have protein with it as well i think tonight i'm gonna have butternut squash ravioli with a side of ants on all of it. <laughs> i mean those are meals but also snacks so if you just need something in the day and you're not super hungry those are great options sean and especially if you're in that, like McKenna said earlier, if you are all of a sudden you're getting to that moment where you're super ravenous, you can have those things even if you're not hungry. You, But you, you kind of know that pattern like, okay, I should eat at this time. Maybe I can have one of these. Oh, guacamole is good for that too. Mm-hmm, guacamole or avocados in general. Talking every day with our amazing nutrition guests has been so enlightening, but even just chatting amongst ourselves, I know helps me so much. So I hope that everyone listening takes something away from this episode, especially if you've been facing anxiety or mental health issues and are going down your nutrition path. So please grab a cup of tea and enjoy this episode with advice from our past guests. The first being with group home manager, Wendy Sterling. Health is understanding what you need. Being informed. Finding that balance of mental and physical. Building yourself a support system. Figuring things out on my own and not letting it hold me back. You do kind of have to advocate for yourself. Because health, it's personal. The anxiety is there. I still have 
some side effects from it even now. Um, one of those is my health is really impacted by my anxiety. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I haven't had a panic attack in over five years. You know, I'm much more pragmatic. Um, I don't think the anxiety completely goes away. Um, but I've learned to manage it to such a degree now that, you know, it's very minimal. But what it did do was one of my coping mechanisms through my worst time, if you like, when I was in counselling and suffering horrendously with the anxiety, what the anxiety had done is almost, I'd used it as a coping mechanism to manage the depression. Mm. So once I'd started to address the anxiety, what came out then was serious depression. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It, I'd used it as a coping skill, if you like, to mask that, you know, and, and so what happened was, is as I started to, to basically peel back the layers, if you like, of the anxiety, what came out was this, these feelings of when I was a child of like, not wanting to be here and all of that sort of, you know, really dark stuff that that sort of came out and how I dealt with that was to comfort eat <laughs> <laughs> um, my my relationship with food and my own health has been quite impacted I mean in lots of ways I'm very lucky you know how I didn't end up down the drug route alcohol route right even prostitution right, yeah. route <laughs> you know I always cease to amaze me how <laughs> you know, with, with everything that had gone on that, that I managed to keep almost sort of quite level, really. And a lot of that is down to um, really close friends and some family members, you know, that saw me through those horrendous five or six years, uh, Sean being one of them. <laughs> yeah, Sean's the best. That's really incredibly difficult. And you're obviously so resilient. We talk all the time about having our tribe and putting people around us to lift ourselves up. Do you feel like since you've been able to manage your anxiety a bit more that you've been able to manage your eating habits or is it something that you still face every day? It's a work in progress still. It, it really is. You know, I was a, you know, I was a very, before the counseling, um, I was very much like I was, I wouldn't eat. Okay. You know, um, and and that was, you know, when I was anxious without realizing it, um, I wouldn't eat. So I was always really, really slim. Um, That's how I am. We've heard that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But since I went through the counseling and, and basically relived a lot of anxiety and, and stuff, uh, yeah, I, I have a terrible relationship with food at the moment. But I'm aware of it and I'm working on it. Uh, yeah, I definitely comfort eat when I'm stressed, when I'm anxious. If something does make me anxious, yeah, I'm a real comfort eater now. I never used to be. That has really changed for me. Um, I think we're all comfort eating right now. Mm, definitely. <laughs> and now, Nurse Tracy Eisen shares her advice on nutrition and its relation to anxiety. For me, things that have worked as far as nutrition is concerned is leafy green vegetables. Green, dark, leafy vegetables are the best. Now, the only disclaimer I want to make on that is that if you take a blood thinner, talk with your doctor before you increase your dark green leafy vegetable intake because it, the vitamin K can actually combat the blood thinner. So talk to your doctor before you do it. You can't even have some leafy greens. That's, that's good yeah. to know. Yeah. <laughs> but green leafy vegetables for every meal, if you throw a handful of romaine lettuce, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, just that dark green kale, things like that, it's so good for your body because it's so chock full of vitamins. And, you know, there's also something called the gut brain axis. So I told you serotonin is your happiness neurotransmitter. Serotonin, I think it's about 90 to 95% of serotonin. The receptors are in the lining of your gut. And so researchers right now are in the process of going through and trying to determine if probiotics can be helpful in treating anxiety and depression. Because if you think about it, when you eat a lot of junk food and you upset your stomach, 
something's got to be going on with those neurotransmitter receptors in that gut. So it's called the gut-brain axis, and it's very interesting, something for you to definitely look into if you're interested in learning more about the science behind nutrition and anxiety and depression. That's definitely something we'd like to learn more about. Yeah. Uh, another nutrient that is really important, actually, an electrolyte in our bodies that also helps people feel calmer is magnesium. And uh, really good sources of magnesium include the dark leafy green vegetables like spinach, and also nuts and seeds are chock full of magnesium. So I wouldn't recommend taking a magnesium supplement without talking to your physician first, but increasing those in your diet would definitely be helpful. Excellent. So I guess it's kind of good then that we had dark leafy greens for lunch along with some nuts and... Uh some other good things. So some of the other uh, nutrients that are really important in a diet to um, fight against anxiety and depression includes antioxidants. In 2010, there was a study done that showed that anxiety is correlated with a lowered total antioxidant state. And so foods high in antioxidants have been uh, shown to actually help with anxiety disorders. So again, that's your leafy green veggies. And there's also turmeric and ginger that are really important. Specifically in turmeric, it's the curcumin. That's the specific ingredient in turmeric that's filled with antioxidants. So careful with your turmeric supplements because a lot of them don't have much of the curcumin in it. And if they don't have a lot of that in it, then you're just kind of taking a capsule with some yellow stuff in it. That makes sense, okay. Beans are very helpful as well, and so are berries, blackberries, cranberries, blueberries, chock full of antioxidants that are very good for your gut. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's really helpful and definitely making me feel better about our lunch choices today. The only other thing I can think of to add would be the omega-3 fatty acids, because that's really good in general for eye health, for heart health. And I mean, that would come from eating fresh fish like salmon, you know, um, some of the supplements are not quite as high in the omega-3 as you would want them to be. And really the okay. best way to get those supplements is by including it in your diet. Okay. So eating it naturally through foods instead of trying to take it, you know, through supplements or anything like that is much better. Yeah, it's really the best way to do it. But I mean, I'm I'm not going to tell you not to take supplements. I'm going to direct you to your primary care physician. Right. <laughs> nice. Right. That's very important to note. Yeah. Question about the salmon. You know, is there a particular kind or place that we need to be eating our salmon from that makes it safer, healthier? Are there any concerns associated with that? So the American Heart Association says that salmon and mackerel and herring are like the top three choices. Um, and so, and they want you to have at least two servings of that per week. But really, if you go to um, a study done at Harvard, farmed versus wild, the bottom line that they say is don't stress too much about your salmon selection. All right. Now, purveyors of whole foods will definitely push and say you should do wild salmon because fresh farmed, oftentimes they add color to make them a little bit pinker so they look more appealing. Um, but I think as long as you're including these types of foods in your diet, then you'll go up on that omega-3 ladder and it's good choices for your health. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. And, you know, because sometimes they do, they do make us think about where we're getting these fish from or where this is sourced. You know, it's sometimes it feels a bit like a marketing ploy or something like that. I guess it's important to remember just having it in your diet in the first place is much better than not. Correct. Yep. So you do, we should stop beating ourselves up and adding more anxiety about, well, <laughs> where am I buying this from? Where is it coming from? Um, is that definitely adds a little bit of stress, especially if you don't have access to a store that sells the wild caught from Alaska. Sure. And they also tend to be more expensive because it's more difficult to get to them. So, I mean, it definitely makes sense that just having it in your diet at all is an improvement for your anxiety. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Health It's Personal. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts for bonus episodes and new releases every Wednesday. 
The Health It's Personal podcast is produced by me, McKenna Udi, and hosted with the Phronesis Health Initiative team, Karen Jively and Sean Tingle. Special thanks to portrait artist Alexander, musical contributor Bernie Ramke, and to our guests and experts for their kindness and bravery in sharing their stories each week. Please listen, subscribe, engage, and send us topics we can explore that would help you on your journey. Because health, it's personal.